Let's talk about Lee Brackett, particularly her novel, The Sword of Rhiannon, and some of her short stories. This is a collection I have, uh, Positronic Super Pack number 47, the Lee Brackett Super Pack. Now, Lee Brackett uh, was perhaps best known as a screenwriter. She wrote The Big Sleep, Rio Bravo, and shortly before her death in 1978, she wrote the first treatment of The Empire Strikes Back. And her most famous novel, at least in the UK, I think elsewhere as well, is The Sword of Rhiannon. Uh, which is still a pretty short novel, uh, might be Hugo qualifying at 40,000 words, might not be. Uh, it's particularly famous in the UK for being double bound with Conan the Conqueror, aka Hour of the Dragon, on the first release in the UK of those, both of them. So it got a large circulation at the time with a very popular book. And uh, she had many famous and respected short stories as well, some of which are in the public domain, some of which aren't. I'm not sure on what basis things are in the public domain or not, because... Uh, I'd expect things to be copyrighted, but I guess if they've been sold to a company that is defunct or, or, or something and the rights weren't bought, maybe that's why. Now, the typical setup in her stories includes an adventurer or a soldier, often seeking redemption, though not always, embarking often reluctantly on an adventure in Brackett's solar system, uh, you know, her world. They're not usually connected. A few of the heroes do turn up in a few stories. She had one set of short novels about the same character, uh, the main character of of a fairly important short story uh, in this does turn up by Eric John Stark does turn up in at least one novel of hers. There's often a love interest presented in a pulpy fashion, often a dangerous, tough woman, and there's usually some strange and otherworldly experience along the way, though the form and tone of the strange otherworldly experience vary widely, uh, basically to do with the weird things in the universe, some wonderful, some terrifying, some both. So far, so pulp, but this is much more than standard pulp. I mean, it's Edgar Rice Burroughs, Robert E. Howard and H.P. Lovecraft. They all transcend pulp, but there is something else going on in bracket that is different to those authors. One distinction I've read is between speculative fiction, which is basically typical, the same tone set of ideas and different fantastic contexts, but it's basically always the same sort of thing, just with different iteration, different twists. Uh, one slightly different, kind of like, oh, I'm thinking about this in this novel. And then there's what, by one definition, is called evolutionary sci-fi fantasy, speculative fiction. Something where new ideas are being treated, where the world moves on or develops, whether in terms of plot or in terms of something else. And Brackett is under that very simplistic dichotomy, an evolutionary writer. I say simplistic because um, Burroughs explores different social and philosophical ideas, but he doesn't push and develop the sci-fi fantasy ideas themselves. Uh, he doesn't create great interior life in his characters. You get what I mean. Partly, you have to give her credit for invention in that she's a very early person to combine sword and planet settings with heroes from, for instance, the noir genre and uh, from the emergent Western genre. And given this, she started writing in 1940, she therefore is also a very early innovator of the Western style hero in sci-fi. In fact, she's just about the earliest writer I've read um, in writing space opera rather than just sword and planet to do so. Uh, her heroes travel around on the frontier in spaceships. They try to stay free. They are troubled by their past. Her heroes are the obvious forerunners in the tradition to Han Solo and Mal Reynolds. But the actual stories also tend to be creative, innovative in their own right, and not just iterative. Uh, if nothing else, sometimes just the, the ways she decides to set up plots show a degree of invention. For instance, this is set on Mars to start with, more or less in our near future, relatively, a few hundred years perhaps but involves time travel to the past of Mars by an Earthman, um, which is an unusual setup, right? You know, it's not something where it's John Carter going from our Earth to Mars via whatever means he was using, or Carson of Venus doing the same. Uh, it's someone already there in a built-up civilization, in a world that already exists that she's written about in other novels, suddenly going to that world's prehistory. There is a density to the setting. She invents a world which is mostly standalone, but where she gradually fills in different parts of the history of that universe. The nature of her solar system, the nature of technology, and it creates a, a varied and compelling texture compared to the quite enjoyable solar system of Edgar Rice Burroughs or the very reflective ancient world of Robert E. Howard. They're both worlds I really like, but Brackett's world building is just a step above. To expand on the question of world building, humanity has spread across the solar system, meeting both very alien species and on Mars a basically human type ancestry, uh, I guess like the main races of Barsoom, where most of them are basically humans but with different colour skin. Uh, also riffing on the tradition we see in say Burroughs and C.S. Lewis, Mars is an old, nearly dead planet, I mean and indeed War of the Worlds, 
whilst Venus is a young planet, that's more like Burroughs and C.S. Lewis. They're both human friendly, uh, humans can live there, but Brackett develops beyond those parts of the planetary tradition. She goes in different directions. Her Mars is much grimier than Barsoom, much, certainly much grimier than uh, uh, Malacandra in the Space Trilogy, much more in the way of history, geology, culture. The Low Canals, Jakara, the Norlands, the Gates of Death, and in the Sword of Rhiannon, the ancient history of Mars as a fertile and watery world. She adds a Mercury, uh, and in fact, the, the fact that it's like that does actually affect plots. Um, water and the relative paucity of water that only goes through the low canals, which keeps the cities of the plains of Mars going, is a pretty important point in black, toward the end of Black Amazon of Mars, where the hero realises he needs to protect that. She adds Mercury, a Mercury, where air only adheres or remains in the low valleys, um, and it's an otherwise dead world, it's otherwise not particularly hospitable. Venus has various native sentient ancestries who interact with the human colonists in different ways. Really well and movingly explored in Citadel of Lost Ships particularly. And uh, it's interesting, it's over 20 years before John Ford's Cheyenne Autumn attempts to talk about the American West and the experience of Native Americans uh, in some of the same ways that Brackett is talking about in, in the 40s. And then there's the use of Jupiter's moons, the powerful aliens from Callisto, for instance, who provide the one great threat to human dominion in the solar system. Uh, there's the mountain of madness like aliens in Black Amazon of Mars, which does, I feel like, must be directly influenced by uh, by the mountains of madness by Lovecraft. And she has a, it has far fewer weird repetitions, though. Uh, she has a great skill for haunting strangeness in the world. Shanak the Last, Child of the Sun, Black Amazon and Mars have more on that. Deal with that idea that the world is strange and um, upsetting and moving and beautiful. She's also very good on character. Her characters aren't psychologically realistic in the way we might think now, but I, I don't mean, that doesn't mean they're not realistic. What I mean is they don't have these sort of like intense reflections on the meaning of life and on uh, the angst of their childhood and things like that, but rather they are coherent and internally realistic. They're compelling. Her heroes are basically always male um, and very much 90% of them are in the Han Solo Mal Reynolds vein, not all of them. If you're interested in that metric, you might want to know that, but there are very powerfully drawn female characters too, usually in the Valeria from Red Nails vein, but even tougher, more dangerous, more emotionally compelling. So Brackett operates within both old character tropes and new ones that she is helping form, but also adds real inner life to those characters beyond that. So old tropes done well, new tropes created, and real depth to those character tropes. And there's also some genuine sci-fi creativity here. The mud of Io and its anti-metal properties. The one moment in Stellar Legion where uh, the characters turn a major problem in this moist world that they, they're living in, into a winning advantage and so forth. And we are often given the puzzle the characters face and then we see the solution hove into view and the pieces come together and the rules are obeyed in a satisfying sci-fi manner. Uh, and not that there weren't other similar sci-fi writers in the 40s, but it certainly shows an originality of thought and a step beyond uh, the, the relatively simple history of sword and planet romances up to that point. As I say, developing into a wider, more nuanced space opera genre. So I enjoyed those. I certainly recommend The Sword of Rhiannon. Uh, I very much enjoyed The Sword of Rhiannon. And my edition here is, which is a first paperback edition from the UK, which was only £2 or something. But that's 128 pages. You can read it in a day uh, easily for most of you. And short stories, this was on Amazon print on demand. Uh, I don't know the copyright situation of it. It doesn't mark copyright, but some of her works are in the public domain, so this may represent that. And this has some very good stories on it, particularly things like uh, Outpost on Io, Sister of Lost Ships, Black Amazon of Mars, Shanak the Last. Those are all, I think, four, of, maybe the four of hers that I've liked the most. Uh, but yes, if you've read Lee Brackett, what do you think of her work? What are your favourite of her work? What are your other favourite space opera? And remember, space opera is kind of westerns in space. Space opera and sword and planet. Uh, what what are your favourite in that genre? And uh, and I suppose what other early sci-fi really gets you going and, uh, and for you seems really important in the history of the genre? Tell me in the comments. Till next time.